Today we'll be taking a quick look at System Architect and how to use it with the features of the Crown amplifiers. I already have System Architect open on my computer and as you can see there's really no information here. Uh, the venue view is blank. This is because I do not have an amplifier connected to my computer either through USB or through Ethernet. If I did, the software would automatically find and show you the amplifier or amplifiers that were connected in the venue view. Since I don't have one connected, I'm just going to manually come over here to Crown. You can see here Crown. And I'm going to select the CDI series and I'm going to drag it into the venue view. And as you can see, it says offline. That is because it's not actually connected to my computer. I can still do things to it while we're offline. And then when we connect to the amplifier, it will uh, upload those settings or give me the option to upload those settings to the amplifier. This is very useful if you want to do some basic setup before you go to the job site. So I double clicked on the amplifier where it said uh, in this case offline and I get the controls for this particular amplifier. If I had more than one you would see multiples of the CDI series or other amplifiers such as CTS or iTech HD. The first thing you'll see moving from left to right are two sliders. These are actually the output control sliders. These are not the same as the knobs on the front of the amplifier on the CDI series, which are input control knobs. These two uh, volume controls actually control the output level of the two amplifier channels. Although we don't have anything playing right now, here you'll see two sets of meters for input and for output. These will show you real-time input and output metering. Uh, the input side is obviously the source that you have connected and the output is what the amplifier is actually producing in terms of power. Down at the bottom there are two uh, sets of controls for the two channels. A mute button. As you can see when I mute the ready light goes out. There's also a temperature OK light. Obviously green is good. If the amplifier was in a fault condition due to overheating, this would light up and the ready light would go out as well. The next stage we'll see are the actual controls for the amplifier. You can see that as I roll over the buttons, there is active help displayed here at the bottom. The first step is the input. If I double click on input you can see I have an input mode control. The input mode control for this amplifier is very simple. Stereo is exactly what it sounds like. Left in to left out, right in to right out. If you sum it, this will take a stereo input or two mono inputs and send them to both outputs. An input Y is exactly what it sounds like. You take a mono input and you send it to both channel 1 and channel 2 outputs. For most uses in an outdoor system we recommend some so that we can get the same signal at all the speakers for best coverage. If you are setting up the amplifier for a true stereo application, like in a house, stereo would be the correct way and it would be also the default when the amplifier is first turned on. So we suggest some channel 1 plus channel 2 for most outdoor applications and distributed audio applications. There's also a pink noise generator. This is simply for testing to make sure that the speakers are working. So I can go ahead and X out of this. The next step is the output voltage. You can see it says 70 volt. 
That doesn't mean that it's actually set to 70 volts. It's just where I would select it if I want it. Again, I double click on it and I get the voltage settings. You can see that this amplifier is set to 8 or 4 ohm. The amplifiers are stable uh, down to below 2 ohms. We just select 8 or 4 ohm as the uh, way to describe what the output is. I can selectively choose 70 volt on one output and not the other. These are independent or both. If I select 70 volt, it is very, very important that the are actually 70 volt speakers. If you select 70 volt and connect an 8 ohm speaker, you will most likely destroy the speaker. Conversely, if you select 8 ohm and you have a 70 volt speaker, you will still get sound, but it is very unlikely that it will be of good quality or high enough output. So it is important to match the output to the speaker that is actually connected. I select what I want, I hit apply. Now I close. If I come back in here and double click again, you can see that it's still set to 70 volt. The next step is the output mode. Uh, this is very simply either dual or bridged mono. For most applications, we will be using dual. It's very rare that we would use bridged mono except where we wanted very high output for things like subwoofers or if we were using speakers that were capable of 140 volt operation versus just 70 volt operation. In most cases, you don't need to change that. The next section EQ, crossover, output EQ, delay, and limiter. These are all things related to the speakers and the individual outputs. If I double click on EQ, this is actually the input EQ. So if I make changes here, I will be actually EQing the input signal. For example, the CD player or a microphone uh, or an other input. I can see channel 1, I can see channel 2, I can switch to, between the two here. I can also show all channels at the same time. We'll start with just channel 1. You can see that channel 1 is bypassed by clicking that button. There's a high shelf uh, and low shelf filters. I can select the type and the gain. And as I click gain, you can see it start to appear in the graph. If I click the enable button, it goes out. And enables and disables. These EQ filters are actually parametric. As I enable and disable them, again, that will turn them on or off in the signal path. You can see I can use the slider. I can click on the up and down. I can type. I can also click and drag here using these drag boxes and they are completely interactive. going to close that. The place where you might want to use input EQ is, for example, EQing the input source, for example, the CD player or the microphone, versus the output, which is the actual speaker output. The next stage is the crossover. Again, I just double click on the crossover. Uh, you can see that there, uh, in this case, I'm just seeing one of the crossovers. 
if I select uh, independent, I can now see both at the same time for channel one and for channel two. By selecting 70 volt, there was automatically a, a, a low uh, filter put in. Uh, this is because 70 volt systems are, are very poor at dealing with low frequency information, uh, especially in the transformers uh, that are inexpensive where they may overload or short circuit and cause the amplifier to turn off. In the transformers that we use in the JBL uh, control series speakers, these are very high quality transformers, so we can in fact lower this frequency and get more bass out of them than we could with most other speakers. In this case, I'm going to set up a simple high-pass, low-pass crossover. I have connected my subwoofer to channel 1 and my satellite speaker to channel 2. So the first thing that I will do is set a low-pass filter. I'm going to come in here and type in 100 hertz. I will turn on this uh, roll-off on the low end just in case to uh, keep the transformer or the woofer itself from being overdriven at extreme low frequencies. But I'm going to set it at 30 hertz. I can come in here and change the slope filter to different filters, make them sharper or narrower. Typically, a 24 dB per octave, either Butterworth or Linkwitz Riley, is what most people use. You can see as I change it here, the graph changes. I can also adjust the relative gain between the two crossovers. I can change polarity. In most cases, you won't need to change this, but occasionally, when dialing in a speaker, it might be necessary. On channel 2, I'm going to set a basic 100 hertz, 24 dB per octave, which matches this 24 dB per octave. I am not going to set any uh, low-pass frequency here to roll off the highs, but I might want to, in some cases, roll off extreme highs. Uh, in this case, I don't, and in most cases, you don't need to. Again, I can adjust the relative output between these two bands. Generally, you don't need to, but occasionally, occasionally, be helpful. Once I set this, I can go ahead and close it. Output EQ. This is where you probably would do most of your EQ. This will actually uh, affect the speaker outputs. So if you have a subwoofer and a main speaker, these EQs will actually adjust the sound at, at that specific speaker versus on the input source. They work exactly the same way. I can turn them on. I can adjust them. I can drag them around. And this all ha happens in real time. You can hear these settings being adjusted while listening to music. I can do the same thing on channel two. I can show both channels and I can click on them and adjust them. The delay is very basic. It's the easiest way to time align two sets of speakers that are in different positions. The simplest way to do it is to simply measure the distance that they are apart. For example, maybe the subwoofer is 10 feet away from the satellite speaker. You can just come in here, type in 10 feet, and the milliseconds delay uh, is automatically adjusted.
I would most likely not want to have two different sets of delays in this case, but I might want to use two different delays if I had two different clusters of speakers and I wanted to align them to each other or to a third set of speakers if I had multiple arrays. In most cases, you've got a subwoofer and a satellite and you simply need to adjust one to the other. So you pick the one that you're closest to and delay it to adjust it to the one that is further away. And on the output side, we have a very basic limiter. This is a safety limiter. The default is off. I can easily set a 3 dB or a minus 6 dB limiter. These are fast acting limiters to catch peaks so they don't blow up your speakers. The JBL Control Contractor Series speakers also have a uh, limiter built in to the crossover to help uh, protect the tweeter. Uh, this will help protect uh, the output of the amplifier as well. The best way to set this is to turn up the music to a reasonable volume, pretty close to clipping, or as loud as you might want to play it, turn on the limiter, um, and then back it off one setting from where you can hear it. You could also simply set a minus 3 dB or a minus 6 dB point uh, for safety, and uh, and leave it at that. For most people, minus three dB is a is a good safe setting. That's the basics of the CDI series. If I want to save this as a setting, I can store this by clicking store, picking a preset, naming it, hit OK. I can then come back and recall this at any time by clicking Recall or any of the other presets. Uh, the first DSP setting, DSP Off, is uh, not editable. It's always there on all the amplifiers. DSP Off will obviously bypass all the DSP. If I want to take these settings and save them, I can easily go into the File menu, and I can save the device file or the preset file. The device file is all the settings, including all the presets for this amplifier. If I have multiple presets and I want to take them and load them onto someone else's computer so that they can use them as well, I can do that through the device file. If I want to just take this one preset and load it into some other amplifiers on some other computers, I can do that through the preset file. Uh, either way, the settings and the process is basically the same. I'll take the device file and I can save it as my settings. If I take that file, which is a relatively small file, I can send it to other people, put it on other computers, and then go into the file menu and open that device file. And then all of the settings that I had done would now be in this device. Now I'll just quickly show you a different amplifier. You can see that it's very similar. All of the settings and controls are relatively similar. All the CDI amplifiers will use the exact same control panels. However, if you had a CTS-8200, which is an H amplifier, this particular version, the USP-CN, is the version with the DSP card, which is optional. You can see now I've got a second amplifier here, the CTS-8200 USP-CN. I'll go ahead and double click on that. And what you'll see appear are basically the same controls, but obviously now we've got 
eight amplifier channels because this is an eight channel amplifier. In this particular amplifier, <clears throat> again, we'll have uh, input and output medium and input and output uh, controls and mute for each channel. There are some differences. Uh, because this is an 8-channel amplifier, it's got several different inputs, not just the two analog inputs. So we can go ahead and select uh, many different inputs on a per-channel basis. Um, analog, Cobranet um, as both an analog or a digital source. Um, there's <clears throat> lots of different choices um, for mute and polarity on a per channel basis. But again, this is an eight channel amplifier, so it's really just eight times the exact same thing uh, as compared to the two channel amplifier, which is only two. So it's really the same controls, just more of them. On this particular amplifier, the uh, 70 volt switch is actually a hard switch on the amplifier so it would not be set in software here the bridging is also a hard switch on the amplifier so it's not set here but it would be displayed again uh, it has similar controls there's input processing in this case there's uh, compressors delay, and EQ for the input channel itself. This is the source itself. Obviously, you can have up to eight inputs, and you can EQ and delay each of them differently. For most of us, that wouldn't make much sense. Uh, we would probably be using this as inputs for different zones and we wouldn't really need to adjust the delay on the input. Really, we just need to adjust the delay and EQ on the output. But it is there. You can see here, speaker processing. This is the exact same thing as the output control on the CDI series. It's just labeled speaker processing. That's really what it is. And it is that way on the CDI amplifiers as well as the CTS amplifiers, regardless of what the label is, this is really what it does. So again, there's crossover, there's a delay, there's a, an output limiter. In this amplifier, there's a little bit more control. There's a peak voltage and an RMS limiter. Um, this allows you to set both a fast and a slow control. For example, the peak voltage will keep the uh, peaks from having uh, a detrimental effect on your speakers. The RMS power will help to keep the amplifier from overloading or overheating or from the speaker from being damaged over a long period of time. And again, setting these is best done by ear. The easiest way to do it is to turn the amplifier volume up and to play some music and to adjust the limiter until you can just hear it start to work and then back it off slightly. In the amplifier settings again here is where you would see the bridged mode um, and whether or not it's 8 or uh, 70 volt mode. Uh, this is a display because the actual switch is a hard switch on the amplifier. There's also uh, error reporting, including line voltage and thermal and clip errors. You can see all of these in this display. These are not something that you can adjust, but simply something that you can see in the display of the software. The load monitoring is a way of the amplifier. This is a Crown uh, DSP uh, control. And it helps to keep the load on the amplifier constant so that the amplifier is always working 
in its optimum range. This is not something we suggest changing for our use. This is a very specialized control and if you think you might need it, you should contact tech support and they can help you set this up. As a reminder, everything that we're doing offline will be pushed to the hardware when we connect the amplifier to our computer. The system architect software will give us the option of sending the settings from our computer to the amplifier once the amplifier comes online as connected to our computer. In this way we can make some changes offline or in our office and then go to the job site or connect the amplifier uh, when it's convenient and send all of these settings into the amplifier. We don't need to do a separate save step Everything that is uh, active in the amplifier is being saved in real time and is in protected memory, meaning that if the power goes out, it will turn back on in the same state that you left it. Brings to an end our uh, system architect overview and crown amplifier overview. If you have any questions, please call tech support. Uh, Harman Luxury Audio Group Tech Support is 888-691-4171 or csupport at harman.com.